is Diagnosis Glaucoma with your hosts, Dr. Mona Colleen and Dr. Harry Quigley. Hello there, and thanks for joining us. Today, we're going to be talking about glaucoma surgery. It's a continuation of our previous two discussions. But now we're going to be talking about minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries, and specifically the ones that are used to treat your angle, or they're called angle-based MIGS procedures. And MIGS stands for Minimally Invasive Glaucoma Surgery. And you shouldn't confuse that with the Russian version of an aircraft, because when I was a kid, that was what you know, we always had air fights among the kids, the U.S. saber jets and the Russian MiGs. No, this is definitely not the same thing. Hopefully this is nicer than that. Okay, so MiGs procedures, we've already discussed the traditional surgeries, the aqueous tube shunt and the trabeculectomy. MiGs came around maybe just in the last few years. Harry will go into a little bit more discussion on the history but I just wanted to briefly touch on how you decide whether you should have a traditional surgery or one of the MIGS procedures. So generally, I'd say that the traditional surgeries are reserved for a person who needs to have a lower eye pressure, who wants something where there's more data to support the outcomes, and who's also willing to go through the post-operative period, which can be a little bit more cumbersome than a MIGS procedure. With the MIGS procedures, when you're deciding if you should have one of these, you have to think about what is the eye pressure target, which every doctor should always tell you what your eye pressure target is. So if you're someone who needs an eye pressure that's very low, then you may not be a great candidate for a MIGS procedure. Also, what is the goal in terms of using eye drops afterwards? You might still need to use eye drops with MIGS procedures. In fact, many of the studies that have been done on the MIGS that we're gonna talk about today do mention one of the success outcomes as being getting off of one eye drop and sometimes more, but there is an expectation that you're still going to be using eye drops. Whereas with a trabeculectomy and an aqueous tube shunt, there's a much greater chance that you'll be able to come off of a medication. You know, I think the <clears throat> persons who are listening here who hear about us talking about target pressure if you haven't already heard our podcast that deals with target pressure or the podcast that dealt with the basic elements of open angle glaucoma, you may want to go back and listen to those after this one. And the reason for that is that only about half of patients with glaucoma, with open angle glaucoma, have what you'd call a high pressure. The other half have a normal pressure. And so if you have a normal pressure, but the treatment for your glaucoma is to take it from the middle of normal to low normal, those are the folks that we're saying may not do so well with the newer procedures, which are designed to get water out of the eye faster. So if you look at every one of these new procedures, much like tube shunt surgery, much like trabeculectomy surgery, they're working to get the fluid out of the eye faster, but they're trying to do it without completely bypassing the original normal way that water gets out of the eye. If we put a tube in the eye or we do trabeculectomy surgery, we're giving up on the entire apparatus that normally handles removal of water from the eye and putting it through a new shunting procedure. The procedures that Mona's going to be telling you about here today largely replace only the first step in how water gets out of the eye and leave the rest of the steps the same. And while that can have a pretty good effect on lowering the eye pressure from 28 to 20, it doesn't do so well trying to lower the eye pressure from 17 to 12. Although they have many fewer complications, although the recovery time is faster without any question, the MIGS procedures have a potential role for doing certain kinds of things for certain ones of our patients. Now, the MIGS procedures that we're going to discuss now, which again are the angle-based ones, are generally used for open-angle glaucoma. So if you have a history of angle closure, there are really only a few instances when you'd be a candidate for this, and that's, well, if you have the closed angle and then your doctor does either a laser treatment or in surgery is able to open your angle, then you might be a MIGS candidate. But generally, the studies that have been done on these and the way that these are approved by the FDA is for open angle glaucoma. 
Sometimes people and I, in having a conversation about MIGS and trabeculectomy and two chunk surgery, will say, well, doctor, what do you think about these procedures? And it's more important what you as a patient think about the procedures after we tell you fully what we know about them. If you are interested in a procedure that's new and potentially very useful for you, but we haven't done it for five years, you might say, well, I'm planning on living more than five years. You guys aren't telling me anything about what's going to happen in 10 or 15 years. With tube shunt surgery, with trabeculectomy, I can tell you what's going to likely be the case 15 years from now. These newer procedures, though, have relatively few downside risks. And that's why we're willing to offer them to you at a point where we don't actually have five-year data. Having a MIGS procedure will not affect your ability to have one of the traditional the aqueous tube shunt or the trabeculectomy type surgeries. In fact, you can have a MIGS after you've had one of those procedures or even before because these do not go into your conjunctiva. They don't affect the conjunctiva in any way. They just go into the angle of the eye in the same place where we do the selective laser trabeculoplasty. You might have heard us talk about that. We call it the angle. And some of the experts who really have been the leaders in developing these procedures see the newer operations as an intermediate phase between eye drops and outpatient laser treatment and tube shunt and trabeculectomy on the other hand. Sort of an intermediate zone for a moderate selected group of people who qualify and need what these procedures can do for them. Now, before we had the MIGS procedures, there was actually two other precursors, the trabeculotomy and the goniotomy. Harry, can you tell us a little bit about those and how we went from that to the MIGS? Yeah, these were procedures done, one with a knife, goniotomy, and one with a rounded instrument, trabeculotomy. And the idea was that maybe there's a block of the ability of water to get out of the eye in the trabecular meshwork, and by slicing it open, you could improve how the water gets out of the eye. Well, that was tried first in adults, and it was tried in children. And interestingly, it is still done in children and has been done in children since the 1940s and 50s, and both of these procedures, goniotomy and trabeculotomy, are still done for childhood onset glaucoma. But that's a situation that's quite different from adults. There was an extended period during which they were tried in adults and didn't really work well with the vast majority of persons with open angle glaucoma. And so they were kind of abandoned for a while. Then some more interesting, and I think frankly, more thought through approaches to this with either devices that go into the trabecular meshwork, they're inserted like a snorkel, or better ways of making the incision have been being tried. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So let's start off talking about the procedure where you actually slice into the trabecular meshwork and into the angle of the eye. So there are a couple of different devices that do this. One is called the Kahook dual blade. Another one is called the Omni, and there's also a procedure called G-A-T-T, -T, GATT. With the goniotomy, so again, all of these that I just mentioned are used to perform a goniotomy. We're actually going into the trabecular mesh. We're cutting a certain amount of tissue out of the eye. Sometimes it's around three clock hours, and other times it's more than that. We can actually do the entire trabecular mesh work for 360 degrees around the eye. I will tell you that in my hands, these procedures have worked very well. I usually do them either standalone or in conjunction with cataract surgery. I would say that the people who are good candidates for these procedures are folks who don't need a severely low eye pressure. I've also seen that patients who have done well with selective laser trabeculoplasty, the SLT, also tend to do well with these procedures. But my patients that have not had great results with that trabeculoplasty Generally, I have not seen such great results with the goniotomy procedure. That's my personal experience. Others may have other experiences, but that is my take on it. The other procedures to mention are the stents. There are two main kinds of stents that we have now that actually go into the angle of the eye. One is called the eye stent, kind of like an iPhone. There's a little I and then capital S, T-E-N-T, -E the eye stent. And then also the hydrus, H-Y. D-R-U-S. 
and both of those are devices that stay in your eye and continue to hold the trabecular meshwork open. The ones I mentioned previously, the goniotomy, well, in that we're just making an incision into the angle of your eye. Nothing is actually getting left behind, so you don't have to worry about that issue at all. It's interesting to me that what these procedures that incise or cut the trabecular meshwork do wouldn't heal. Now, if I slash my skin on the back of my hand, I hope it's going to heal, and normally it does. And so there wouldn't be an open slice in that location for a long period of time. So when people first proposed this, it was suggested that, well, you're just going to slice it, and it's going to heal shut, and you won't wind up any better off for your eye pressure than you were before because there'll be a scar there. We know that you can make a hole in the iris of the eye, and it doesn't heal. Why would something not heal in the inside of the eye? Because in evolution, we didn't want a lot of scarring to happen in the portion of our eye that does the seeing. A lot of mechanisms were devised such that the response of the eye to an injury is often very minimal healing, and especially right here in the front of the eye. Now, having said that, there isn't any good detailed look histologically at an eye that had one of these procedures five years later. And I very much look forward to those studies and even to doing those studies because that's the kind of thing I've done over the years. If somebody invents an operation, they say it works because of A, I go study it, and it turns out it worked, but it didn't work because of the mechanism A they thought. It worked because of mechanism B that they didn't think of. Of course, we only care that it works. So the healing factor also means that suppose you could have one of these surgeries again later on down the road if needed, but hopefully you're not in that situation. There's no yet data on anybody having one of these things done twice. The GAT procedure, for example, gonioscopy-assisted trabeculectomy or trabeculotomy, that procedure literally tears open the entire trabecular meshwork. And I would actually seriously doubt the possibility somebody could get a threaded suture through there a second time after that procedure was done. It'd be a real tour de force. There's also something called the trabectome. I don't have as much experience with that as you might, Harry. Can you comment on that? Yeah, there was an instrument devised that was going to open the trabecular meshwork. It was a cautery-like device, so it actually had a heating element in it. It had a special probe that was placed into the meshwork to essentially burn it open. Our group did what we've done with a lot of the newer procedures, and we had one of the surgeons who was excited about the potential for this procedure do almost 100 of those procedures. And during that time, they were looking for very selected people who had a reason why other surgeries wouldn't work for them and why this might be beneficial for their particular problem. After doing that many, we found that the success rate, while it was sometimes successful, was nowhere near great enough to be enthusiastic about continuing to do it. And so our group has abandoned that procedure. And of course, the folks who it didn't work in very well have gone on to be doing well with other surgeries. You can find a lot of good information on the internet about all of these different kinds of procedures. So you could do research on your own to figure out what you'd like. And then you can find the doctor who's best suited to that procedure. I would say that many of us have different comfort levels with various procedures because we do more of them than others. Sometimes people ask these devices, the eye standard, the hydrus, when they go in, can I still have an MRI scan? And the answer is, yeah, they don't have any things that are metallic, that are magnetic, and therefore you're perfectly safe going ahead and having an MRI scan. There is a device called the Express Shunt, which is actually made, I believe, out of titanium. And I'm told that it is slightly magnetic. Now, there's not been a person who had a problem with an MRI scan with that device in, but I think people need to know that there is some small possibility there, but not with any of the procedures or devices that we're discussing here. With these angle-based procedures, we already mentioned that these are best for various forms of open angle glaucoma, or if you're someone who has refractory, meaning uncontrolled ocular hypertension, and you've failed every kind of medication out there, then you could have one of these angle-based MIGS procedures. Also, we mentioned that having a previous eye surgery does not preclude you from having a MIGS procedure either, although we have to take certain precautions and make sure you're a good candidate. If you have pre-existing scarring in your angle, 
then this is probably not the best option for you. With the eye anatomy, we're always checking that before we recommend one of these procedures. We're looking very carefully to make sure that we can see the trabecular meshwork, which again is where we're either making the slice or putting the shunt in place. Now the procedure itself, they're all pretty short. I would say anywhere from five to 10 minutes when done alone. When done in conjunction with cataract surgery, they just add a few extra minutes on top of the cataract surgery. The goniotomy procedures can all be done standalone. The stenting procedures, so the eye stent and the hydrus, are currently only FDA approved to be done in conjunction with cataract surgery. So if you wanted to have an eye stent or a hydrus and you don't need cataract surgery, that would probably be something you'd be paying out of pocket for. The procedure is done in a surgery center, just like all of the others. And postoperatively, the downtime is pretty short. I'd say maybe about a day or so, you could go back to more normal activity. Whereas with the traditional glaucoma surgeries, there might be a few extra days of the immediate post-op recovery period. So with the MIGS procedures, like I said, you're able to get back into your normal activity a lot faster. The risks of these procedures are low as compared to some of the other surgeries. The benefits are to lower your eye pressure to get you off of a few eye drops if possible, and I think that's great, especially when you look at the benefit-risk ratio. Certainly, the benefits are far greater than the risks. Long-term expectations, though, is something you need to watch out for. With long-term expectations, it's a little hard for us to comment on that because we don't have all that long-term data like we do with the trabeculectomy and the aqueous tube shunt. So I'd say to be a little bit guarded with your long-term expectations. We've both certainly had patients who've just had a standalone MIGS procedure and not needed any other glaucoma surgeries or needed to be on eye drops afterwards. I've certainly seen many successes like that. How about you, Harry? Yeah, there's no question that's the case. It's interesting, people might ask, well, are these things FDA approved? Now, if you put a device on there in the eye, case of the eye stent and the hydrus, the device needed to be approved by the Food and Drug Administration. On the other hand, the GAT procedure, the one that tears open the trabecular meshwork 360 degrees, is done with an approved suture. And the Kahoop Duo Blade is done with a surgical instrument. Well, surgical instruments do not need to be approved by the FDA. So some of these procedures actually began being done because a surgeon thought it was a good idea. They did enough of them to report a series in the peer-reviewed literature, and that's pretty much all we know. And in fact, none of them, to my knowledge, has ever been done in animal experimentation, where we have said, well, let's try to see what actually happens with one of these things one week and six months afterward, because they were essentially either bypassed in terms of FDA approval, because that's appropriate for a surgical change of a step in a surgery, or they were approved in combination with doing cataract surgery. Let's discuss complications of angle-based MIGS procedures. Probably the top potential complication is a hyphema, where there's blood that leaks into the front of the eye. Because remember, again, we're going into the trabecular meshwork, and behind that, there's a system of blood vessels, canal. So when we go into that part of the tissue, there can be blood that leaks. And that blood, we see it at the time of surgery often. It usually clears on its own in a few days. There have been a few cases, especially of people who were taking blood thinning medications, where that hyphema or that blood lasted a little bit longer and had to be removed surgically. But generally, I would say that the hyphema, the blood in the eye, can reduce the vision a little bit for the first few days. It does, again, clear up pretty quickly. The device also can be put in the wrong place. And the hydrus one, which is quite a bit longer than the eye stand, it's a pretty good beast. You'd say, what, two clock hours of the eye the thing occupies, yeah. can be put in the wrong place. And we unfortunately have seen someone who had a separation of the iris part of the eye and the ciliary body from the wall of the eye. It's called a psychodialysis cleft. And those sorts of things lead you to wonder, well, how much experience does somebody need to be able to do this kind of a procedure? The 
Companies have methods for training surgeons. All of our young surgeons who are going to be doing these procedures go through this with artificial eyes and even with you know eyes from the abattoir, from a slaughterhouse, to be able to try the procedure out. But I think if in this early phase of MIG surgery, you probably want someone at one of the larger institutions or someone who can document that they've done quite a lot of them before you have it done for you. Dear listeners, we have an addendum regarding the hydrus and eye stent implants that we mentioned in this episode. At the time that we recorded the episode, we do mention that these devices are safe with regards to MRI testing. However, since the episode was recorded, we have come to learn that there is now a 7 Tesla MRI system and that patients who have an eye stent or a hydrus may potentially be at a risk. So, if you have one of these implants in your eye, then get a card from your doctor to show information about that implant. And if you have to get an MRI, show it to the technician to make sure that you are safe to undergo the MRI testing. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, your mom says take your drops. 